You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Write Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, what authors did you dislike at first, but later grew into and grew to like their work? And today to answer, we have on a variety of different authors, including Brad Dunn, author of After Dark Vapors, Bridget Canning, author of The Greatest Hits of Wanda Janes, and editor of What's Written in the Ladies, comic author Peter Bro, Paul Carberry, author of the Zombies on the Rock series from Engine Books, Aaron Vance, editor of the From the Rock anthology series, Ali House, author of the Segment Delta Archives series, as well as a frequent contributor to the From the Rock collection of anthologies, Peter Foote, owner of Fiction First Used Books, the founder of the Genre Writers of Atlantic Canada page, and frequent contributor to the From the Rock anthology. Gareth Mitten, contributor to About Face and Dystopia from the Rock. John Haas, author of The Reluctant Barbarian. Carolyn R. Parsons, author of The Forbidden Dreams of Betsy Elliott. But first, Brad Dunn, author of After Dark Vapors. Are there any authors that you disliked at first but later grew into? I feel like I've gone on a bit of a journey with Stephen King for sure. Like, yep. I, I loved him when I first got into him and then I went through a period where I totally like rejected him <laughs> and now i've kind of come back to like a new appreciation of him I, he's, I, he's been around so long that it's almost like that I've, I've heard a lot of people say that same like i've gone on a journey with stephen king yeah it almost reminds me of a paternal figure where you go <laughs> yeah. on a journey with your father you yeah. start out liking them and then you reject them and then you come <laughs> back to them you realize yeah. dad's okay 100 like, percent. no that's definitely a great analogy uh i would say george r, r. martin yeah uh, when i first read game of thrones I read it before the show came out in preparation because like, I, I, I like to read books before I see the adaptation. Sure. And I was so stoked to read it. I had wanted to read it for a long time. I read... I think the prologue to Game of Thrones is one of the best things I've ever read in my life. Yeah. Like, the, it, it's one of the few moments, I think, where the TV show didn't live up to the books and exceed it. Like, I prefer the TV show to the books, to be honest. Yeah. I remember reading that prologue and just being blown away. Like, that, like, like when we were talking about chasing the high, like, that was, like, that was, like, high, like, right into my veins. Like, yeah. oh, my God, this is so brilliant. And then it just, like, falls off a cliff. <laughs> like To me, I have, I've had a similar thing with Martin, but in a different way. Like, I didn't not like them and then grow to like them. Yeah. It's, I don't think... I was shocked when Ned Stark was killed at yeah. the end of the first book slash season. Yeah. And I don't think I ever regained that mo- like Like, that moment of, it's, it's a cool thing to do, and it's a cool moment, but that moment of, like, you've spent an entire book setting up a protagonist, and you've set up a, like, you've set the dominoes in motion, mm. but then, oops, nope, yeah, heads yeah. off, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's a cool moment, but it's impossible to top. Right, yeah. What happened was that, I so I, I, I got, I read it up to the part where Littlefinger betrays him, yep. and then I threw the book across the room, because I thought he was, I thought Ned Stark was an idiot, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I got really frustrated with the book, and I never watched the show until like season when season four came out. Yeah, then I was like, I'll give the show a try, and I, I loved the show. I fell in love with it, and I gave the books another chance, and I learned to learn to like the books. I don't love the books. No, so I think George R. R. Martin is someone, and there's like there's moments in those books that are that are brilliant. Yeah, like. Just, he never hits the high for me that he hit with the prologue. Yeah. But throughout the books, there are there are moments that are that are. Usually, it's up north, like the stuff, the northern, like it's 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 something that you haven't seen a lot of. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the Lovecraftian, like northern, like Arctic horror, like. Yeah. Um, what, what's that story? It's like the scientists find underground. It's what the thing John Carver's the thing was based on. Yeah, definitely influenced by it. Yeah. Um, Drawing a blank. Me too. One second. At the Mountains of Madness. Oh, okay. Yeah, so at the Mountains of Madness is very that I feel like that's that's 
the influence on that moment, but like all the stuff up north and with the the like the White Walkers, and that that is I think when his writing is at its best. Definitely. Um, unfortunately, is uh, the political stuff is I feel like is at his worst, but he seems to just want to write all that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. He, he seemed to want to write like the War of the Roses with yeah. H.P. Lovecraft and Arthurian monsters in it. Yeah, like the the stuff up north is like it's so it just so pulls you in, and it's so just beautifully crafted writing that yeah. that um, you don't see enough of in those series. Yeah, um, just other writers that I've my opinion has changed. I've always hated Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> Me too. I always hated Kurt Vonnegut with such a passion. It's uh, boring. I have nothing against the guy, but like I had such a visceral hatred of Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah. Like shock. I like it shocked me how much I hated that book. Yeah. No, I, I'm right there with you. Uh, I also was not a fan of uh, <laughs> Fahrenheit Nine Le- or Fahrenheit Four Fifty One. Thank you, Fahrenheit Four Fifty One. See, I really like that book. See, I like the theme and I like the message and I like yeah. everything about it. I just it's in delivery that I don't. Okay, I, know. I read that book the one and only time I read that book was in high school when they yeah uh, when they make you yeah they make you yeah <laughs> and, I, and I enjoyed it. Um, but I, I've I've been reading a lot of his short fiction. Ray Bradbury's a weird guy. <laughs> He's a crazy guy. Yeah, um, I like him. Uh, yeah, I can't think of anyone else that I I used to not like, but now like. Fahrenheit. That's not by Kurt Vonnegut. That's by Ray Bradbury. Yeah, Ray Bradbury. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna cut that part out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, why'd you bring up Ray Bradbury? <laughs> I think yeah, like uh, when I when I first got into reading, especially like in high school, I was really into like the genre stuff, and then I did my undergrad and discovered all the like the modernists. Like, yep. you know writers and then i had this like real like i really turned my back on the genre stuff and i was like that's like not literature and this is real literature and then i think everyone does to a degree and i think that's how you get good genre literature is yeah that someone learns what a lit classic is yeah and then they sit down to write a novel and they have nostalgic feelings of genre from childhood so they right. put that into their lit novel yeah and so yeah like and then i've come out the other side of it now where where I really, I, I really have have like a new appreciation of the stuff that I used to love. Yeah. As when I was first got into to reading, and you know when I discovered the when I was given a good uh, context for the like that modernist kind of hard, I guess you would say, literature. Like I really had a different opinion of it than I probably would have. I remember in high school I tried to read uh, the Sound of the Fury. Good luck with that. I was like, what is this book? I tried to read it in college. In, I tried to read it for a course yeah. in college, yeah. in university, and was like, what is this? <laughs> I tried to read the book. I couldn't get through it. I tried it as an ebook, figuring maybe because that's my preferred medium. But couldn't get through it. I tried listening to it as an audiobook. Couldn't get through it. I read the Wikipedia page. I couldn't get through that. <laughs> like, it was just like, Apparently, no. there's... I've heard they want to do a new edition, which is what he'd wanted to do, where the where it makes sense. The, yeah, but the first the, that first part, which is written from that perspective of the kid, I think he has autism or something. Yep. He wanted to use different font color to suggest the different timelines. That would be helpful. But obviously, especially in the twenties, that yep. would have cost an absolute fortune. Yeah. Uh, even now, that would still cost a lot of money. Yeah, but I think just definitely more of an audience for it now. But I, yeah. I would be interested in reading that, and I still don't understand why they don't do it now. But like he wanted to put the family tree at the start of the novel, sure, which would have made a lot more sense because some of the characters are named after each other. Yeah, so you don't know like who he's talking about. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, Faulkner. There are issues. <laughs> yeah. that, that's an example of an author that really... I have some respect for him, but it, like when you think about authors who really don't care if the reader gets it, yeah, that's it. I think there are there's definitely points where he's guilty of playing too many games with the reader. Yeah. But I... Man, there's parts of Faulkner that for me, like my jaw just drops. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Light of August. Light of August is probably his most accessible novel it's like stunning 
Okay. And I read that in high school when I had like that. That was my first Faulkner novel. Reading it, I'll give that a shot. And then I tried to read Sound of the Fury after it, and yeah. was like, "What is going?" On? But there's no like, there's no. I think there is a mistake that happens where they like they, they force you to read Sound and the Fury, and yeah. I'm like, this is not. This is not something you can be assigned to read. You have to be in the right headspace yeah. for this kind of insanity. A great literature degree and course is to give you the right introduction to a, a writer. Yeah. And I don't think th- throwing Sound and the Fury at someone who had never read Faulkner, mm-hmm. or let alone had never read any of this like modernist era yep. literature. <laughs> I mean, it's like... It's like sending someone out into the middle of the night with like a shotgun into the forest. Like, oh, go get a bear. (laughs) Go survive. It's like, no, like you got to start them, like give them a couple of short stories, like, or something. Just like ease them into it. Like, know where he's coming from. And luckily I I started with Light in August, which is much more accessible. And there's no like uh, stream of consciousness in that book. There's no really abstract kind of style. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Bridget Canning author of the greatest hits of Wanda Janes, and editor of What's Written in the Ladies. What what authors, if any, did you dislike their writing at first, but then grew to like? Oh my goodness. Authors that I disliked at first. <laughs> I've, I've, I, I, have, uh, I went through a Stephen King phase when I was younger. Like, I was probably like 12 or something like that, and I read nothing with Stephen King books for like a couple of years. I read like 17 Stephen King books in a row, and then I kind of got really sick of them. Um, but I've had a new, a new appreciation for him yeah. over the past few years. Like I read uh, Stephen King's um, a, a Memoir on Writing, which is really a great book about about writing. Yeah, it is. Um, and uh, and you know, some of his, did I read? I read something of his lately. Um, and just the kind of appreciating how he's kind of shaped, uh, like they're 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 just he just he's, he's so distinctive. Um, you can recognize his work so easily, whether it's a, a movie or, you know, a line or something like that. Um, so I think I have a newfound appreciation for him. I don't think of anyone else. No, most writers that I hated when I first re- read them, I kept on hating them. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the same. I think, uh, I think King is so prolific that you end up... I was talking to Brad Dunn, and we compared it to, like, a father figure, where you start out, start out when you're young thinking that dad is the best, and then you go through a period in your early 20s where it's like, yes. I don't like my dad very much, and then you kind of learn to respect him, you come back to him, you go, you know what, dad's okay. Like, yes, it's yeah. that, but with an author, and he's so prolific that he's become, like, a weird father figure that you don't always agree with for the industry. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I can't really think of anyone else okay. off the top of my head. Thank you very much. Next up, we have comic author Peter Bro. Uh, Stephen Donaldson. Oh, yeah? He, he wrote uh, um, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever. I remember reading that in the early 80s and thought, ah, oh, this isn't that good. And then I started reading it and reading it. And, yeah. You yes, know, fantastic nice. story. Like That is something that really blows my mind that somebody hasn't picked that up. Yeah. Like Amazon hasn't or HBO hasn't or Disney or somebody hasn't picked up that that, you know, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant the Unbeliever because it's it's brilliant. He's yeah. as far as I know, he was the first anti-hero in 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 fantasy. Like he that's that's the part that that threw me at first was the fact that he wasn't in here. He was he's this leper guy with a ring of white gold and he's bitter towards his ex-wife and he he's in this land and he and, he, and you know, I don't want to give too many spoilers but he doesn't believe he's there so he's like ah yeah whatever guys and i thought at first i thought this is so stupid and then as i got reading it i thought no wait a minute this is actually quite brilliant you know and that the bad guys were bad yeah and the good guys didn't always win actually the good guys got uh, you know they got quite a beaten quite a few times. You know, if, you've, if you're familiar with the storyline, you, you know what I'm talking about, eh? Yeah, I'm uh, you know? I'm a fan of that kind of writing, too. In, in mine, the heroes rarely, rarely win 100%. Like, there's usually some associated cost to it. Oh, absolutely. A great, great story, you know. And actually, I think he's got a new set of books out now that involve the same characters, eh? Now, I don't know what he's done with them. It's been... 
you know, quite a few years since I've, I've tackled it, but now it makes me want to actually go back and reread it. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Paul Carberry, author of the Zombies on the Rock series from Engine Books. Uh, are there any authors that you disliked their work at first, but then grew into? Uh, uh, Steve Altine uh, wrote the Mag series. Uh, it's probably my fault I didn't like his writing, because I picked up book number four in the series before any of the other books, not realizing that it was the fourth book, started to read it, and I was like, he's not very descriptive. He's not even describing the main character at all. Why would he make this choice? I don't know what's going on. I put the book down. I was like, he's a horrible writer. Yeah. And then years later, I found out, no, I read the wrong book. And when I first picked it up, I already had the bias. I didn't like him. Yeah. I was reading it, and I was like, it's not that good. And then the more, I was like, I'm going to finish it because I want to watch the movie. Yeah. And by the time I got to the end, I was like, nope, this was great good yeah it's a good lesson it's a good thing to think about as a person who writes a series themselves to be conscious of like the new reader right. like to be conscious of like okay for someone who's never read this before maybe i should just give a brief description of eric exactly like yeah. you know like i'm not just gonna like stare at the novel and bang it's just eric did this yeah i, I would probably put like a little descriptive like yep yeah. Just something in there. So There's readers. a few of my books the, in the uh, the Coral Beach Case Files, the old Black Loom series, that I was so, like, again, like the fourth Meg book you're talking about, like, you needed so much to, a background to understand it, right. that I threw up my hands and said, all right, I'm going to put a section at the beginning that says, previously on yeah. this, like, like a TV show, exactly. previously in this, and just a couple pages of this, and if people don't want that, they can skip it. Exactly, but... Uh... I think every now and then you have to be conscious, because, like, I guess for Mr. Altine, when he wrote the fourth Meg book, yeah. why are you reading the fourth Meg book That's if true. you haven't read the first three, and it happens? That's fair. I mean, it would be my own fault if I wanted to pick up Game of Thrones and started with book six. Exactly. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Aaron Vance, editor-in-chief of Engine Books and the editor of the From the Rock anthology series. Are there any authors that you disliked their writing at first, but then grew into later? These, are, these aren't necessarily authors that you edit, but... No, 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 I know. I'm thinking um, most of the authors I didn't like when I was little, I read so much, like, when I was, like, before grade 8 and everything, and I think I was just too young to appreciate them, but I still have that stigma in my head, so I actually haven't really gone back to them. Okay. Maybe I should. There's a part of me that, was, like, people bring up these series, and I'm like, I read that when I was 12, and they're like, I read that when I was 17. And I'm thinking, maybe I should go back and read that again, because when I was 12, I didn't have a sweet clue what was going on. Yeah, yeah. You, you can miss a lot of allegory. You can miss, like, I, I read Animal Farm when I was very young, mm. and I've read it since, but when I first read it, I wasn't aware that it was a political satire. I thought it was just talking animals. Because it's talking animals, and yeah. I was 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Ali House, author of the Segment Delta Archives series, as well as a frequent contributor to the From the Rock collection of anthologies. Are there any authors that you disliked at first, but the more you read them or knew about them, you grew into and you grew to like them? Honestly, no. <laughs> um, if I don't really like an author, I don't really read their work because there's so many authors out there that I do like or I want to see if I like. So I don't really read for them. Like, honestly, maybe controversial. I don't care for Charles Dickens, so I'm not going to read his work. Okay. There. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you think there are certain books that might be a slog. Like you think, you know, oh, Dostoevsky is going to be such a drag. But when I read Crime and Punishment, I really enjoyed it. So I was really surprised by that. Are there any authors where you read one book by them, didn't like it, even if you didn't know anything about the author, and then, you know, you, later you read another book and were like, oh, I actually do like what they do? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Peter Foote, owner of Fiction First Used Books, the founder of the Genre Writers of Atlantic Canada page, and frequent contributor to the From the Rock anthology. Boy, boy. Or we can not uh, ask that one. <laughs> no, no, I actually got an answer now. Okay. Um, would, have been, would be Terry Brooks. Um, I was given his first novel, The Sword of Shannara, when I would have been 
early teenager. And this would have been right after I had read The Lord of the Rings. Okay. And I've, um, his first novel, which is it's almost the, the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings condensed into one book. And I, I said to myself, I just read this book, basically. So I, I put Terry Brooks aside for years. And everybody said, well, no, give, give the next book a try. And here's another one in, in his series. And no, no, no. But then I did. And I picked up Elfstones, which would have been the second book he, he wrote in that series. And I fell in love with it. And there's another one of my books that um, that I pick up every year, year and a half, and reread, even though I know exactly what's going to happen. But that book, that reconnection with somebody um, really resonates with me. And I really gave uh, Terry Brooks a second chance. And I, I'm glad I did because he's become one of my favorite authors. And I've actually had the pleasure of meeting the man twice and he's very humble and really enjoys meeting his fans wow cool did you tell him that you started hating him yeah i did and he says you're not the first person who's told me that <laughs> <laughs> well that's a sign of a good uh good guy then if he can take that in stride wow yeah you actually were just reminded me that uh, perhaps the strangest thing my my one of my answers for this could be for that question like authors that you didn't like or maybe series that you didn't like but i tried to read the first dark tower book probably 20 times before before i actually got into it i kept putting it down mostly because of the first section really yeah have you ever read the dark tower books oh yes um and actually the dark tower the first one is the one that I do go back and reread and, and kind of pretend it's a standalone. Yeah. Some of the some of the sequels are better than others, but um, I know I actually really enjoyed how the, the first one opens. How it talks about uh, chasing the man in black across. No, the that I understand. My issue is what with what comes after that because it confused the heck out of heck out of me, especially as a young reader, because there was. He comes across the man with the cornfield, and he tells the man a story, and then inside that story, he goes to the town and meets a girl, and they have a bit of a yeah. fling, and then he tells yeah. that girl a story, and then, like, it keeps going further and further back in time, but it's a story within a story within a story within a story, and I'm like, stop it, Stephen. Well, actually, I enjoyed that. It, it pulled me in. Oh my god, um, that that pushed me away. That put up a big um, hand and was like, no, no. If it had been a 500-page novel, I probably would have given up. But Dark, The Dark Tower, if memory serves, it's like, oh, 250 or less pages. So And it, it actually, it that's short. the only one that started out serialized. Each one of those sections started out being published in magazines as its own short story. That's interesting. <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, I obviously love him now. I have read, and I wrote my, uh, my honor thesis on the dark tower so clearly i got over it yes you did yes thank you very much next on the line we have gareth mitten contributor to about face and dystopia from the rock uh are there any authors that you disliked at first but later grew into their writing i mean not them personally that's interesting <laughs> Nothing really springs to mind. I, I, I'm sure if I went away and thought about it, maybe. I, I have that instant. More, more often, I'll get a pretty quick feel of whether it's going to work for me. You know, I, I read Philip K. Dick's short story and was hooked, and everything I read, pretty much of his, I love. Then there's a flip side where uh, I might, you know, get really inspired to read something and then just really struggle with it. And one example of that would be, uh, so Gore Vidal, on uh, I think he was on like Strombo a few years ago, and Gore Vidal was kind of like you know so he, so Gore was quite old and frail on the show, and Strombo asked him you know if if there was one book that you've written that you would wish people would read, which one would it be? And he said, oh, Creation. I wish you know, people should read Creation. I got really inspired to try and read Gore Vidal's Creation. Yep. Man, dude, like if you can get through that book, you're a better man than me. There were. <laughs> It, it's, it's like historical fiction and there's so many characters and they've all got these weird kind of highfalutin Roman Greek names. I just couldn't do it and I really wanted to, but I couldn't get through it. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have John Haas, author of The Reluctant Barbarian. 
Uh, are there any authors that you, and I mean, I don't mean ones you know personally, I mean authors you've read, that right. you disliked at first but later grew into? John Hess? Ooh, that is a good question. I'm actually looking at my bookshelf as we, we talk. I was going to say Neil Gaiman, but... Roll with I it. Was, we'll say Neil Gaiman. Uh, Roll with it. <laughs> I was first introduced to him through the Sandman comics, which I, I still love and i loved from day one and then i got into his novels which i do enjoy but they did take me a little bit longer to get into um something like american gods which is i don't want to say artsy that's not quite right but it's very it's more cerebral than some science fiction and fantasy that i'm used to reading I found so, American uh, Gods hard. I really loved Good Omens. That was that was witty and fun. Oh yeah, yeah. Good Omens is awesome. Yeah. And I, I'm ne I'm never entirely sure with Good Omens if I like it because it's Neil Gaiman or if I like it because it's Terry Pratchett. That is an excellent question and kind of an unan unanswerable one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I loved, actually, my answer to this question, uh, like er, uh, authors that you didn't like at first then grew into, is Terry Pratchett. But uh, okay. it's it's an interesting one because I tried to read the Discworld series and I tried to read it starting from the beginning and I did not like the color of magic. And uh, then ah. professor of mine said, no, 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 start with death. Start with all the Mort books. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I liked it. It's just, I don't like Rincewind for some reason. <laughs> well, I, I, I liked his luggage. Yes, that is fair. <laughs> that is fair. I thought, what an interesting character. It never speaks, but it's got a personality. They kind of did that in Fantastic Beasts, didn't they? Uh, He's got that magic oh, yeah. luggage. Yeah, yeah. Oh, weird. Yeah, good point. All right. I never made that connection. That's really good. Interesting. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Carolyn R. Parsons, author of The Forbidden Dreams of Betsy Elliott. Um, Margaret Atwood. Really? Do tell. Yeah. I read um, The Handmaid's Tale when I was very young, 22, just because everybody's like, this is a good book, Canadian, got to read it. And I read it, and I went, Neh. And then I had, and a, and a teacher I had at the time that she wasn't teaching me, but she was a teacher, a friend who was a teacher, who taught English literature, and she hated her. She hated Margaret Atwood, hated her. She thought she was awful, and she said she wrote that book like she did because she can't actually write, so she wrote it from an amateur's point of view, so it looked like... <laughs> Huh. <laughs> it, this guy, that, that was honestly, she hated, now I wasn't that bad, but I mean, I paid attention, I thought, yeah, I don't really, I'm like, what is she on about, that's, you know, and, and I didn't pay any attention, now, of course, in the last couple of years, <laughs> things in the world has changed, yes. <laughs> and I decided to reread that book, and it sat with me for days and days and days and days where I would think about the book and where we are in the world and, and realize then that this it was what she was doing. But I and I in the meantime, I had read Oryx and Crake, uh, Oryx and Crake. Someone gave it to me for Christmas. And I, I think probably my husband and which I was weird because he didn't know that I didn't like Mark Matwood. Anyway, um, I didn't like that one at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna have to reread it. So like for a long time, I was like, I just don't like Margaret Atwood. It's just me. It's, she's probably fine. It's just me, you know. Everybody else likes her. But then when I reread um, *Handmaid's Tale*, I was like, oh wow! Like this is such a powerful message, and and at the timing, right? And my age, you know, and and having the experience of seeing things as you grow up, 22. Like I was probably hung over when I read it or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> like I read it sober this time. Yes, but, that, that's, uh, that helps. I hear. <laughs> yeah, you know. But I mean, I remembered it, and I remembered the story, you know. But I just thought, I don't. It was one of those I don't get it, and just didn't care for her at all. And now, like I said, I and I really admire her, and I love her essays. And when she writes, you know, the other things she writes. So, I she's definitely it has. It's all completely changed around. But uh, you know. That was a long time ago. So Absolutely. I, I have to forgive my younger self for just not getting it. No, you don't. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I make but, it a know, policy to never forgive my younger self. I, I don't need to forgive myself for the alcohol, though. Those days were fun, too. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that had to be done. So, uh, yeah. So, no, that's, that's definitely it. And uh, that's a great question. Thank you very much. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.